For over a century, tucked in a blue-collar nook of America, the Penn State University football program has stood among the nation's elite, a symbol of excellence in simple blue and white. Since 1966, the Nittany Lions have been led by one man. Think about making four yards. And then you have a short yard at that thing. Joe Paterno. Come on, take off now. Let's go. A feisty Brooklynite who passed through the Ivy League on his way to becoming a coaching legend and an American institution. Under Joe Paterno's tutelage, Penn State has tallied two national championships, five undefeated seasons, and 22 bowl victories. His teams have achieved success with dynamic offenses, punishing defenses, but most notably, honor. It's not phony. I mean, anybody that's been in the program will tell you the integrity is the most important thing in this program, more so than winning and losing. You talk to anybody who's played a Penn State team, and they're going to say, they're a physical team, they're a clean team, they're a fair team. And that's success with honor in my eyes. We're going to do the little things the correct way because he's trying to build values. That's what the whole motto is about, is, is really, you know, doing it with respect, honor, and grace. Good job, Hager. Success with honor is just Joe's way of saying that you know, we can be a high-level, high-powered, successful, you know, football program. Come on, Eddie, be tough out there now. And we can do it with class. Now look, you guys got to put a drive together. Now let's see if you got a little class and you get a good drive together. And whatever the result is, we accept it. Yeah, I mean, the, the success with honor, I bought into it at 17 years old. And, uh, and, you know, and it's no surprise that, you know, 20 years later, I still buy into it. Keep them open. I'll have a little fun out there today. When we, a young man comes here to play football at Penn State, our fans, our coaches, everybody around the program knows that we're going to take care of them, try and educate them, and get them ready for life beyond football. From your manners, the way you look, the way you prepare, and the way that you, that you are after the game. I mean, there's a whole process, and you take that whole formula and, and move through your life with that. What Joe's trying to instill with these young men, that football is a short-lived part of your life. You want to win football games, but you're going to have to be a student first. You're going to have to go to class. If you're not going to give an effort, you're in the wrong place. Believe me, you're at the wrong place. They're going to play for Penn State then it's got to be that whole package, not just some form of football that they're participating in to launch them to the next level. Don't be afraid to lose a game or two if it means doing what's right for your student athletes. Don't be afraid to have plain uniforms and have black shoes. I mean, people don't realize 20 years ago there were two or three schools in the whole country who wore black shoes. There's a lot now. Um, but you know, we had black shoes and plain uniforms. People used to make fun of us all the time for those things. I've gotten a lot of <laughs> flack about the uniforms aren't very fancy. And the names aren't on the back. I just tried to, to let people think, hey, there's, there, Penn State's a little unique. When you put on the Penn State uniform, you realize you've earned something. Part of what I and a lot of other guys like me understood at a very early point in being here is that there is a tradition, and pretty soon this is going to be handed over to you by these older players, and you have to uphold that tradition. I think the neatest thing that we do with our tradition here is that when we get dressed in our locker room building and get on the bus. Ah, yes, the blue buses, yes, the luxurious, the luxurious blue buses. They had to get from the locker room where they dressed over to the stadium, so they rode the buses over. It's a school bus. No luxury bus, it's a school bus. As the years went by, the people got to know when the buses would arrive and where they would unload. Now that bus is synonymous you know, with so many fans. You know, they, they can't wait to see the team. It's not a fancy thing. You, 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 you wait, you're, you're waiting for it to break down because it's such an old bus. It's probably the same one for us. The front right seat is Joe. Joe sits in the front right seat, and the front left seat is the starting quarterback. So if you want to know the starting quarterback that day, just, just stand on the left side of the bus. You'll know. 
go through the tailgaters, and you go through the fans, they honk their horns, they run out to the side of the road. There's always one person waving a Penn State flag at one intersection. They make their way up Porter Road, and you know, it's just I don't know, seven, eight, nine, ten deep along the side. On Saturdays, when you're taking that drive, if you're not ready to go, if you're not focused, it doesn't take you long to get focused because you realize just how important this is to so many people. I mean, this is, this is like a, for lack of a better word, it's almost like a religion to them. And then when they get there and all the fans out there saluting them as they go in, it's almost like the gladiators entering the arena. It's really exciting and it's, a, it's something that's dramatic to see. If you're not ready to play when you get off that bus, you may as well check your pulse and go home. There wasn't always great fanfare surrounding the Penn State football team. The very first pigskin squad on campus was formed in 1887 by two freshman students. Beginning with the two-game season schedule, the team eventually played 11 games a year by the turn of the century, playing such area schools as Bucknell, Lehigh, and Dickinson. But by the 1920s, as the college game was gaining popularity, it was already being infected by many of the ills that plague college athletics today. You can go back to the beginning in college football. It's had problems with corruption. It's had problems with cheating. The administrations and the faculties wanted to do something about it. So they created a commission, the Carnegie Commission. This was a, this was a national commission that came down on college football and said it should be de-emphasized. When the Re Penn State was named in the report, when it came out of, of being one of the, the scallywags, you might say. Penn State did away with scholarships, they did away with uh, scouting, but some of their opponents didn't. Well, what happened was they found a way around the rules to get football players at Penn State. They went into the coal mines and the steel mills of Western Pennsylvania and the coal mines of the scranton Wilkesbury area, and they pulled kids out of there. They got them jobs here, they got them housed, and pretty soon in the late 30s, Bob Higgins, who was in the coach, started pulling the team out of its depths. By the 1940s, they were a power. That Penn State team of 47 set several NCAA de defensive records that are still records today, which tells you how, how good they were back then. They were not only good, but socially progressive as well. In the mid-40s, Penn State football was at the forefront of racial integration in college sports. In 1945, Wally Triplett, became the first African-American to play for the varsity. Triplett was joined by Denny Hogard in 1946. That year, University of Miami officials strongly urged Penn State not to bring its two black players for a late season game in South Florida. The Penn State team voted to forego the game. It was a statement against intolerance and an early moment of Nittany solidarity. Meanwhile, after the 1948 season, Coach Bob Higgins stepped down. He was replaced for one year by Joe Bedink. Before the 1950 season, Penn State tapped Charles Rip Engel, whose uncle Lloyd played for the state in 1911, to take over the program. Now, Rip wasn't just an ordinary coach. He'd had this great team at Brown in the 40s. So Rip said he'd take the job. Penn State says, okay, but you have to keep all the current assistant coaches. Rip said, okay, I'll do that, but I want to bring one coach. So they said, okay, you can bring one coach. So Rip asked two or three of his coaches up there, and they both turned him down. One eventually succeeded him. So he asked his quarterback on that 49 team, Joe Paterno. I was going to go to law school, and uh, my dad and I owed some money, and I didn't want to borrow any more money. My dad didn't want me to take this. He said, we'll figure out a way to pay it. Anyway, I said, well, let me get down here. And I came down here. I only made 3600 bucks. That's, that's when I made the first three years I was here. I lived in the dorms. I got free meals, you know, so I could save some money. 
I didn't even like this town. It was a hick town. I'm a big, I'm a city boy. I'm Brooklyn. I, I went to school in Providence and came down here and I said, geez, I couldn't even find a good plate of spaghetti. But when I got here, I had never coached. And uh, I said to Coach Jango, what do I do? He said, here, go home. And he gave me a whole mess of, in those days, 16 millimeter film. And he gave me a projector. And I, I watched me, old single wing, and we were going to the wing tee. So, but the, I, you know, there were a lot of good football players here, a good tradition. There were a lot of people here that uh, really cared. So I, I thought it was pretty good. Called my mom up. I said, Mom, I'm going to coach. She said, what'd you go to college for? In 1949, Penn State renewed athletic scholarships. The 1950 squad had the first scholarship player since 1928. And Rip Engel made the most of the sudden surge in talent. Lenny Moore was recruited from nearby Reading, Pennsylvania. The high-stepping Reading Rambler became state's first single-season thousand-yard rusher. The defense, meanwhile, was anchored by yours truly, Roosevelt Greer, a four-year starter on the defensive line. In 16th season under Coach Engel, the Lions went 104 and 48 with four ties. By the early 60s, his teams were playing and beating program from the Big Ten, Big Eight, and other powerhouse conferences. While flirting with a top 10 ranking over that time, Penn State won his first three bowl games in school history. Interestingly, Engel made only four changes to his staff during his 16-year tenure. His ability to run a successful program with loyalty and honor was making an impression on his protege, Joe Paterno. I thought Rip was probably one of the most underrated football coaches that's ever coached. He was an innovator. He was great with people. Never heard him swear. Uh, tough, but in a, you know, in a, in, a, in a nice way. And Joe worked his way up from the Originally, the quarterback coach, he was the offensive coordinator, he became Rip's right-hand man, and eventually succeeded Rip in 1966 as the head coach. Well, I took over a pretty good team. We had recruited a good freshman team, so when Rip decided to give it up and they gave me the job, I, I, didn't, I didn't come into a bad uh, cabinet. It was, there was a lot of people there that were, gonna, that were young players. Just kept hoping I wasn't going to screw it up. He was five and six his first 11 games, and uh, people started to wonder, maybe we have the wrong guy. But the story of what, how Joe really developed this Penn State into a power goes to his so-called grand experiment. This goes back to my dad when I decided I was going to coach, and my, my dad was very disappointed. He wanted me to be a lawyer. His father had very, very lofty goals for his kids. Um, his father went to, went to school at night to get his high school degree after he'd left high school to go in the military. Went to school at night to get his college degree and then got his law degree at St. John's while working a couple of jobs. Uh, and he wanted his kids to do something very, very meaningful. I said, I think I'm going, I really think this is for me, Dad. And he said, well, okay. He said, but whatever you do, make sure you have an impact on that place. Coach Paterno and Jim Tarman, our former sports information director, uh, really felt like uh, they needed to go out and sell the program uh, throughout the state of, of Pennsylvania and come up with a, a theme that they could rally around and sell the program on. And Coach Paterno has felt from day one that we could win at the highest levels uh, and do it with success with honor uh, and to do, uh, do it with student athletes that belonged in, in college. If you can't have a bunch of dummies out on that field. Football is a, is a very challenging sport, more than people may understand. It's very complex. And the smarter players you have, usually the better football players you have. If you gotta cheat to win, it's no fun. I think if you gotta, you know, there are certain things that you've gotta believe in. There are certain values you have to have. There are certain things that are important. It's there to be different and having an impact is really what's kind of the cornerstone of this program. And it worked, it really worked because he graduated people and he won. Now, how can you beat a combination like that? In its first decade under Joe Paterno, Penn State won 97 games. The grand experiment was working, producing victories on the field and upstanding young men off it. Perhaps no player better embodied this than John Capaletti. 
Well, John was a very quiet, very hard working, very smart football player, very tough. He wasn't always the ultimate football player. When he was a sophomore, he was a punt returner, fumbled three times. Called him Fumbletti, not Capaletti. What was the last one you hit uh, Capaletti? Was that the lug three? Lug? Lug two. Yeah, that was a good call. Tell Capaletti he didn't run it right, though. As a freshman, I played on both sides of the ball a little bit, but I had my aspiration was to, to try and play running back that sophomore year. Uh, but with Lydell Mitchell and Franco Harris being seniors, there wasn't going to be much of an opportunity, and, and uh, Joe felt that uh, I was enough of an athlete that maybe I'd be able to transition and play some defense. Capaletti had played defensive back his first two years here. In his junior year, Paterno switched him over to a running back. He needed a running back in that 72 team. He became a great running back in front of a great offensive line. Behind Capaletti's quiet power running style, the Lions followed up a 10-2 season in 1972 with an undefeated campaign in 73. Despite only two seasons in the backfield, Capaletti's 2,600-yard rank among Penn State's all-time rushing leaders. And his 17 touchdown in 1973 helped him become Penn State's first and only Heisman Trophy winner. But during his acceptance speech, Capaletti revealed he had much more on his mind those years than eluding tacklers and collecting awards. So in 73, he became Penn State's only Heisman Trophy winner. But it was his acceptance speech which did it. Last night in New York, Capaletti was presented the award by Vice President Gerald Ford. But Capaletti said he thought it ought to go to someone else. Nobody had any idea what John was going to do. And he got up, and in his acceptance speech, he started to talk about his brother Joey, who was dying from a blood disease. His brother was, 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 was dying of, of, of cancer. I think a lot of people think um, that I go through a lot on Saturdays and during the week, as most athletes do. You get your bumps and bruises, and it's a, a terrific battle out there in the field. And it, but it only for me, it's on Saturdays, and it's only in the fall. For Joseph, it's all year round, and it's a battle that's unending with him and he puts up with much more than I'll ever put up and I think that this trophy is more of his than his mine because he's been a great inspiration to me. You could not hear anything and I mean you could not hear anything. Anybody was just entranced. And Gerald Ford who was vice president I think at the time was sitting there in the audience. I had had my successes, we had had our season, I had won the Heisman that was established, so to, to share all that, especially with him, uh, was, the, was the way I wanted it to go. It was a moment in history, as far as I'm concerned, of Penn State football, tucked far beyond how many yards Cappy had gained and uh, how many trophies he had won. It just got kind of to the heart of uh, what is important. The Capuletta led Lions finished the 1973 season 12 and 0, with no national title game pitting one versus two. Oftentimes, champions were crowned not on the field, but by the wire services. Unbelievably, we finished fifth in the voting. It wasn't the first time we came up short for a national title, nor was it the last. 68 and 69 are probably two of the outstanding Penn State teams of all time. And that grand experiment of outstanding scholar athletes or great student athletes who, who had to study first, could play great football, and, and, and that's how the, the team developed. The 69 team was as good as anybody's. I don't care who we, I mean, we beat, you know, we had beaten two good teams in, in the Orange Bowl back to back. We'd beaten Kansas and after the 68 season and beaten uh, Missouri. They were great defensive teams. Mike Reed, who went on to play with the uh, Cincinnati Bengals. Jack Ham was on those teams. Franco Harris, Lydell Mitchell, you name them. In 68 and 69, the potent duo of Mitchell and Harris was complemented by a hard line defense, which allowed opposing teams to 
to score 20 points only three times over two years. More impressively, Penn State didn't lose, going 22-0 in that span of time. While they were the first of Joe Paul's team to crack the top five, neither year ended as a number one. The 68 team placed second to Ohio State, while the 69 Lions were runners up to Texas. The only regrets I have about that is they never got to be national champs. But we, you know, we were in a small town, no media, didn't even have an AP reporter here, no, no television station. You know, it, it was, uh, we didn't really have anybody going to bat for us. We didn't get the kind of recognition I think those kids deserved. Before Penn State got recognition from the pollsters, it used to irritate all of us who were biased, of course, but 68 and 69, I don't know how anybody could play any better football than that. For our program, recognition came steadily but surely, win by win and seat by seat. Once a 30,000 seat structure on the west side of campus, Beaver Stadium was moved in 1959 boat by boat, one mile east, and expanded by 16,000 seats. While today Beaver Stadium holds a whopping 107,000 Rockets fans. By 1978, its 78,000 seat capacity was big enough to draw increasing numbers of fans and media into State College. Those in attendance got to experience one of the great Penn State teams of all time. The offense was led by quarterback Chuck Fusina, runner-up that year for the Heisman Trophy. But it was the nation's top-ranked defense that spurred Penn State's success. After a win over North Carolina State that ran their record to 10-0, the Nittany Lions became the first team in school history to be ranked number one in the nation. Two wide receivers to the right, fourth and two at the pit four. Here goes Goldman. A victory the following week over Pitt gave Penn State 19 straight wins dating back to the previous season and a date with number two ranked Alabama in the Sugar Bowl for the national championship. It was Penn State's chance to finally settle it on the gridiron. Both teams had trouble moving the ball against the other's defense all night. With time running down in the fourth quarter, and Bama leading 14 to 7. Penn State was faced with a fourth and goal from the one, setting up the most important play call in coach's career. Nearly 30 years later, the Nittany Fate was still agonized over that set of downs inside the Bama 10. Fourth and goal with a half a yard. Goodman, he didn't make it. Penn State's shot at its first title was stuffed at the goal line by Barry Cross and the Alabama defense. It's interesting, I still don't know how the, the defensive back, uh, he played in the pros for a long time. We ran a crossing pattern to Scott Fitzke and Scott caught it. If he would have just fallen down, they were in man coverage. And the guy came off his man and just saw him at the last minute and turned and got him right at the one. Uh, if Scott would have just ducked underneath, we'd have probably scored and we didn't on second down and third down. You know, Matt Suey to this day will tell you he's in and, and, and we don't get it. And then we went on fourth down and they were in a, they were in a good defense and made it, you know, you know, an outstanding play, and it's one of the, obviously one of the famous plays in Alabama history. It's not such a good play in our history. If you want to talk about the most disappointing losses in Penn State history, Alabama against uh, in the Sugar Bowl in 78 would probably be at, still at the top of the list. Finally, we got in a position to where we had our own destiny. Uh, we could take care of business, and we would be national champions. And uh, uh, yeah, it was extremely disappointing. Extremely. But, that's, half a yard. that's where it goes. Goodman. He didn't make it. I walked away feeling really bad. I almost gave it up after that, you know, because I, I felt I kind of let the team down. I felt I didn't give my kids a chance to win it. They had a real bad year in 79 as far as a lot of focus issues and off the field trouble. And a lot of it was because he couldn't quite concentrate and shake off uh, the lost Alabama. 
1978 season was our closest taste of a national title, and it was a bitter one. But we were back in the title hunt a few seasons later, 1982, with an uncharacteristic big play offense with strong arm Todd Blackledge at quarterback. The offense took advantage of the speed of Greg Garrity, Kenny Jackson, and Kurt Warner. Through the season's first three games, we put up 119 points at 3-0 and ranked eighth in the polls. Number two, Nebraska came to town for an historic night in more ways than one. It was the first game ever at the university night game where we had lights. We actually brought portable lights in. And a lot of people don't remember that, but I remember how big a deal it was. Just the feel in the air, the anticipation. It was one of those back and forth, you know, big heavyweight title fight. Back and forth, back and forth. Now here's Penn State you know, in this dogfight. And Turner Gill puts together a great drive down the field. And with about a minute, 20, minute, 30 to go in the game, Gill sneaks it in from the one yard line. And Nebraska, despite everything, is now winning the game 24-21. Todd Blackledge and the offense had to actually take us from one end of the field to the other to score in order to cap it. As a quarterback, when you're playing in the backyard, those are the moments you dream about. You know, your team's down, the ball's in your hand, it's a two-minute drive to, to win the game. Blackledge puts together one of those championship-style drives. And then Blackledge throws a ball to McCluskey to the four-yard line. It was just a matter of question of whether his feet came down in bounds. A lot of people thought he was out of bounds. Every time I talk to Nebraska fans, two or three people say, you know that guy was out of bounds on the sideline. Nebraska still sports those t-shirts that has a little extra square on the sideline where McCluskey presumed to have gone out of bounds. The main thing is that the refs saw it in our favor, so as far as we're concerned, it was good. McCluskey toes, and perhaps a little luck, put Penn State near the goal line with nine seconds to go, setting up a magical moment from an unlikely hero. Penn State had a backup tight end named Kirk Bowman. His nickname was Stonehands. He was a blocking tight end, as Joe likes. He was an extra tackle. Stonehands, Kirk Bowman. He caught two passes the whole season, and they were both in that game, and they were both touchdowns. The second one was the game winner. I was hoping it was right here. <laughs> And he made the catch. He was a guy that was open. And you know what? He made me look good because it was a bad pass. I, I didn't set my feet. I, was, I saw him wide open. I wanted to get it to him. And I threw it a little bit low. And he was able to get his hands underneath it and scoop it up. And it was a clean catch. Probably one of the biggest catches in the history of this university. When that happened, I mean, the entire stadium erupted. I mean, you could just feel the, the earth under your feet vibrate. I remember looking back up into the stands and it literally looked like human lava coming down out of those stands to the field. It was one of the great moments at Beaver Stadium. People wouldn't go home. Having it finished the way it finished was just incredible. And then they lose at Alabama. It looked as though Bear Bryant and the Crimson Tide had once again crushed our dreams of a national title. After losing that game and some of the leaders of the team at the time, we held our own squad meeting. We had some great leaders on that team, Todd Blackledge, Kurt Warner, Joel Coles, you know, Mike McCluskey, Julius Conch, some guys that just said, hey, we're better than that. We can win the rest of these games and get ourselves back in the hunt. And they did just that, handily beating their next six opponents, including title contender Pitt at season's end. Cassisano's kick, it's gone! Then the number three ranked Nittany Lions received the gift as number two ranked SMU was tied by Arkansas. That gave Penn State the number two ranking and a return trip to the Sugar Bowl to square off against the number one ranked Georgia Bulldogs for the national championship. 
When we go down to play Georgia, the interesting thing was those guys that played in 82 were freshmen. They were a lot of them were redshirt freshmen. You know, they were redshirt freshmen in 78, that national title game against Alabama. So when we go down to the Sugar Bowl, they know what to expect. We had a much better perspective of what it was all about, what it was going to take to win that game against a, you know, a great Georgia team. We were very focused. I mean, we, we were about our business and we knew what we were down there for and knew we had a great challenge ahead of us with Georgia and a team that had been dominant in the, in the SEC for the last few years with Herschel Walker. Uh, we have two or three guys that we use as Herschel Walker and they've done a, uh, not at the same time, no. <laughs> Uh, they've done a, a heck of a job getting us prepared. Uh, we've got some great freshman running backs, but uh, we've done nothing different. He's just another running back, no matter what anybody else says. And uh, we prepared for this game like any other game. And uh, nothing fancy, nothing new. We're just going to go out and, and be a Penn State defense and, uh, you know, swarm him. Herschel was such a huge name and such a well known player that. Everybody said, well, they have Herschel. Who do you guys have? How are you going to beat Georgia? But I think that's typical of the Penn State teams, too. I mean, we've always been viewed more as the big, slow guys and the old generic uniforms and the, the black high-top shoes, and we don't have speed and that kind of thing. But the reality of it is we, we usually have what we need. We knew we had to stop Walker. I had told our guys, whatever you do, don't let him go north, north and south. Make him run east and west. He's got great speed. But he's, he's a lot more dangerous when he's got up the field because nobody's going to tackle him one on one. He says we cannot let him turn up field. We cannot give him those cracks because he'll kill us. And we had a kid by the name of Walker Lee Ashley. We put him to the open side of the field all day and Walker said, don't worry, he's not going to get around me, coach. Penn State did a good job of containing him. They tackled his ankles. We took away their primary uh, weapon. By doing that, that really put us in the driver's seat. And Kurt Warner played a brilliant game, brilliant game. And Blackledge played even better than that. And in the clutch, they made all the plays. Blackledge threw the game winner to Garrity. That was just a picture perfect throw. We had run the ball eight plays in a row. And on that ninth play, we faked the run. And they had a freshman cornerback guarding Greg Garrity out there. And he bit on the fake a little bit. And Greg ran by him and made a diving catch in the corner of the end zone. Fran Fisher does the countdown, the Penn State's national champions. Three, two, one, Penn State national champions! It's been a long time coming. He had had how many previous undefeated teams and not voted a national champion. And so to finally have that happen it was pretty remarkable. And to think that it happened with one loss. It had to feel so good for Joe. When you spent a lot of time with Coach Paterno over those years, you know how hard he and the staff worked. And they never quite got the cup for him, for the program, for the university, for the Nittany Lion Nation. It was not only a celebration of that team, but all of the teams prior to that, and the 68 and 69 teams, the five undefeated seasons. In 78, denied at the goal line. So they had been chasing this dream for so long, building so much statewide interest, that when it finally happened, it was just this burst of enthusiasm. In those days, you couldn't fly in a state college with a big plane. So when we came back, we flew into Harrisburg, got on a couple of buses. And then from Harrisburg all the way back along 322, both sides of the streets. It was lined with people. Every town we went through, it was horns blowing, fire engines, trucks, everything. Holy smokes. <laughs> Some places had the band playing and it was it, yeah, something out of a movie. And then we get back into town and out by one of the malls, there's a huge pep rally. I didn't realize <laughs> How, how important it was for, for Pennsylvania to have a national championship team. I think it was a very touching moment for him, and I think at that point he understood the depth of feeling that fans had for the program.
With 19 university campuses peppered throughout Pennsylvania, Nittany Nation permeates much of the state, but concentrated in scenic State College is a population of 40,000 dedicated supporters of the blue and white. In Happy Valley, where the university drives the economy and the football team is like family, success with honor is more than just a rallying cry. It's a truth that draws a community closer. Penn State football in this town is, it's the most famous quote unquote industry that we have here. Uh, it's the thing that most people, you know, recognize. You have to understand how early people come to these games. Well, on our, our home football Saturdays, we become the third largest city in the state of Pennsylvania, right behind Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. And uh, it's just a tremendous atmosphere with a lot of energy and electricity. And to see people come from all different parts of the Commonwealth, from the small towns and to the cities. You look at the students, you know, they're camping out there you know, three days ahead of time. We hate to use a cliche, they're our 12th man, but they get into the game and, and they love football, they love Penn State football because they believe in more than just what happens between the, the goal lines and the sidelines. They believe in what happens in, in the entire being of, of each young man that we recruit and every student athlete to come through these doors. Instinctively you realize that this is more than just about football. Well, it's, it's a unique place because it's, uh, it's set in the middle of the state and everything revolves around Penn State football. It's a very uh, loyal environment because I think it's such a good environment. People to have a tendency to to want to put roots down there, raise their family. I live here now and I've had an opportunity to see it grow since playing in the 80s and economics around this university and football program and how much this football program has made it better. Every time people come back to Penn State, they see new buildings, new hotels, and whatnot. And a lot of it is because they know they'll fill up on football weekends. When I came here, I hadn't intended to stay very long. But, you know, one thing happened after another. I met my wife here. She was a co-ed, and I was a dirty old man. <laughs> and we, our kids, you know, all went to school here. So it's, it's, it's something I love. I love this place. There's no question he loves the school. He's always trying to help fundraise and build, you know, he built the library, the paternal library. It's very interesting here at this school that the basketball arena is named for a former university president and the library is named for the football coach. He had so many chances to go to pro football. I had a lot of chances to make so much more money. But he stayed here because he could walk to work. He could still get to see his family and watch him grow because he believed in family and his wife, of course, soon. She did such a wonderful job believing in family. Well, it's always going to come back to Joe and how he, he, he had set this place up. And that is family first, a family atmosphere. A lot of brothers played here. Kids that he coached, their sons. Fran Ganner and his boys have played here. My father uh, played here. And the Hamiltons, of course, the Collins, there was five of those guys. As well as my two brothers. Franco Harris and his two brothers. A success with honor. I've heard that from the day I was born. I'm one of the guys that had a brother on the same team and we won a national championship together. Now he's coaching, you know, he's coaching the grandsons of his players that played for him. So we've had so many of those combinations. I think a lot of it is, you're asked that all the time, is, you know, the family atmosphere. And I tell people, it must be a darn good place. Freshman squad meeting with Coach Paterno, he said, you know, the, the guys that you're in this room with, you're going to be friends with for the rest of your life. And, you know, as, a, as an 18 year old freshman, you kind of like, oh, okay, I don't know any of these guys, whatever. But he was exactly right. The two days and all of the screaming and yelling and the moments when you're sore and you're tired, but you, you don't want to let your buddies down, so you keep pushing. And that's what brings everybody together. At State College, the family that plays together stays together through victory and defeat. The Nittany family bond was tested in the wake of a heartbreaking Orange Bowl defeat to Oklahoma that dashed Penn State undefeated season and shot at a second national title in 1985. They don't pass often, but they can hurt you, obviously. Oklahoma played really well and won the game 25 to 10. We took a, took a pretty uh, severe beating and, and you know, one of the, the memories that I hold dearest that most people don't think about is I remember that loss and I remember sitting on the end of the bench, time is winding down 
and you know crying and thinking how this was our opportunity for a national championship and we let it slip away. Penn State coming into the game undefeated will lose for the first time. You look around on the bench and in the locker room and over here there's Timmy Johnson you know breaking down there's Trey breaking down I mean it just didn't taste very well. The Oklahoma Sooners the winner and you can tell the losers someone's got to win and someone's got to lose but it never makes you feel any better does it? I think out of that game came the resolve for the following year. That was a great team of camaraderie and friendships. I think if you talk to anybody on that team, that's what they'll remember most about that group. It was a really a close-knit group of guys that only had one goal, and that was to win the national championship. In the season that marked the 100th year of Penn State football, the Lions challenged their resolve into an undefeated campaign. Defense, again, was the backbone of the team, with fifth-year senior Shane Conley leading one of the great linebacking corps in state history. And a year and a day after losing in the Orange Bowl, the Lions were under the Arizona sky in the Fiesta Bowl. Standing in their way of a second national title was Heisman Trophy winner Benny Testaverdes and top-ranked Miami. The supremely confident Hurricanes went about their business in a stark contrast to our reserved way of doing things. Practicing a kind of success with arrogance, if you will. They were very flamboyant, and uh, they had a uh, reputation for the showboat and all those kinds of things. Miami showed up in army fatigues and talked a lot of trash and walked out on a dinner for both teams and didn't want to eat with us and wanted no part of us. I'd like to ask you guys one thing. What's one? Did the Japanese go and sit down and have dinner with Pearl Hawk before they bombed them? No! Let's go. And everything they did was brash and bold, and everything we did was, you know, we showed up for dinners and coats and ties and things like that. So it turned into really a morality play and a good versus evil. They were a cocky group of kids. They should have been. It was one of the best college teams I'd ever seen. I don't think anybody in our locker room really realized how much better physically Miami was than we were. We had very, very good football players on our team as well. and. We stick together as a team, we play together as a team, and that's why we were able to go as far as we did. Were we less talented than they were? Who knows, but uh, we, had, we had some talent on our team as well. When you got to the stadium that night, you could just sense that it was a big deal. You could sense there was a tension in the air, that there was an electricity. We made it a point at coaches' instructions to just not get into the, the word game with them. So we went for several weeks and we had, to, we had to bottle all this up. And when it came time to kick the ball off, there was a chance for us to release all that. Before the game, uh, you know, one of their guys looked at our defensive backs and said something to Shane Conlon about, those of your defensive backs are not very big. And Shane said, you haven't been hit by him yet. Penn State attacked them. Early in the game, they set the tone. There was a ball sent over the middle to Michael Irvin. We had a little kid by the name of Ray Isom. He's only about 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, he gave him a good shot coming across the middle, caught him right underneath the neck. Just absolutely separated him. And at that point, it set the tone for what was going on. And Miami really hadn't been hit like that uh, that season. And once they got a couple of those hits early on, I think they, they started to look around and, and saw we, that that defensive group was not going to back down. Uh, they felt that Miami had gotten a lot, there was a lot of talk about what Miami was going to do to us. And I think it did set a tone. A lot of pressure put on Vinny Tassaverde. He was sacked quite a few times. And then the big interception by Conlon, the second of the game, he runs it back to the six-yard line. And Dozier then takes it in two plays later, and Penn State leads. Now it's a question, how are you gonna negotiate the last six, seven minutes of the game? When the game was on the line that whole season, there was three or four games where the defense would make a play. And everybody in our team felt that as long as they needed to score a touchdown to beat us, we'd win the game. But then with about two and a half minutes to go, Testaverde hit a big fourth down pass. And then get five passes in a row. On 
that final drive of Testaverde's, I can remember flashing back to a year earlier, sitting on the edge of the bench crying, and I remember saying a little prayer, and I said, Lord, you can't do this to us again. And they get it right down on the doorstep, and on a second down play, Tim Johnson comes in and literally, I mean, almost rips his head off. This sets up, of course, the big fourth down play. Fourth down, national championship. There was no place for him to throw the football at all, and give Topless picked it up. And to his credit, he didn't try to run it back. I would have killed him. <laughs> he might have fumbled. It was just an unbelievable feeling of joy. To, when you put a, a group of guys together that's committed to one cause, it, it's no telling what they can accomplish. Being a part of a national championship team, we got a story that can hopefully motivate some young kid to to go to college to, you know, reach for their goals and dreams. So uh, it's it's just a very you know uh, important part of my life, just being a, a part of, of that team and associated with that team. Penn State's Fiesta Bowl victory over Miami proved you can do things the right way and still come out on top. And for the players, a trip to the White House confirmed that even the President of the United States had taken notice of Joe Paterno's ability to achieve success with honor. In my money, I think he's one of the greatest coaches ever in college sports. President Reagan, you know, it, uh, knew what Coach Paterno stood for and all the things that he wanted his players to become. He's never forgotten that first and foremost, he's a teacher who's preparing his students, not just for the season, but for life. It was just f f further confirmation of coach and, you know, all the different uh, areas of this country that he has an influence on. You know, he's a very focused guy, he's a very hard working, determined guy, but at the same time, he has a wide range of interests. You know, I think he, you know, he loves reading, he loves classical music, he loves classical literature. He's not just an X and O guy that can only talk about football, and I think that's what makes his appeal so broad. Over the next 20 years, Joe Paterno's passage from coach into legend was solidified. As his team won nearly 70% of their games while recording 10 bowl victories. His most dynamic score over this stretch was the undefeated 1994 Nittany Lions, led by Kerry Collins and Kajana Carter. The team ranked first in the nation in total offense. And at the time, that 47 points per game was the fourth highest average in the history of college football. Hey, we're number one. You got to give us at least one of them. Got to get at least one of them. We got, we're number one. We're number one. one of, at least one of them. We're number one. Unfortunately for Kajana and the Lions, the posters weren't listening. We finished second in the vote in that year to Nebraska. But the guys did capture Joe's first ever Rose Bowl victory with a 38-20 besting of Oregon. And as the post-game festivities proved, Penn State honor is something the polls simply cannot measure. Joe was in the press conference after the game. And he's answering questions. And of course, he's thrilled by the outcome, how well his team played. And suddenly, out of nowhere, Kerry Collins walks in. Got a little presentation to make. Winning this ball coach in the history of college football, won all four major bowls. He's been an inspiration to myself, to the rest of the team. I know Kerry was so excited to, to give Joe the trophy, I guess, right? He broke in and wanted to tell him. It was one of those really special moments that showed how much a, a coach loved his players and how much the players reciprocated and truly loved him. Those guys were all such great guys. They knew they were good and they were just fun to be around. Let me say this to you. This team made up his mind it was going to be something special. It going to be something special on the field, off the field, and everything they did. They were going to be unique. They were going to be close. They were going to work harder than the other guy. They were going to work as hard as it was going to take to be the best football team they could possibly be. And they have done that. And you ought to be proud of that. And I know you are. to do to get themselves ready 
for this day tomorrow. All right, we are ready. That, that was, that, I've had a lot of great moments. I've been a very fortunate man. Another moment special to all of us was Joe Paz's 324th career victory in 2001, passing Bear Bryant for most all-time wins in Division I football. While the record has since been passed by Florida State's Bobby Bowden, for a while it didn't look like Coach would ever reach that mark. Entering the 2001 season, he needed only two victories to catch the Bear. He's got 323 victories playing Penn State football. To get 324, you're going to have to play Penn State football. But after a 1-4 and four start, Penn State trailed 27-9 in the third quarter against Ohio State. But anyone would tell you a Joe Paterno's team battled to the end with dignity and honor. So we get the ball back after it's 27-9, and uh, we run a draw and we lose a couple of yards and the fans are getting restless. But I said, let's run an option. Let's see what, you know, let's see what happens. Design run by Mills, 35 hurdles. And Zach Mills bounced off the tackle and went 70-something yards, and all of a sudden, it just, it just flowed. Touchdown, Zach Mills! It was satisfying to see Joe get that record and, and finally get it over with so that we could talk about other things besides when is he going to break this record for him. Yeah, you know, I've never taken any of that stuff as something of personal glory. I mean, I've never... How many wins do you get career? I, I hope that I don't ever get to the point where i got to have more wins than this guy. Or I want to... It's a contest between Coach Bowden and myself as to who's going to have the most wins. I, 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 that really has never been very important to me. All I wanted to do was to make sure I, my relationship was an honest one with the kids and in the sport. When I was struggling and going through my things, you know, between, you know, my, my sophomore and junior year, uh, Coach Paterno, he would always say, Mike, you know, you're going to be great. You know, you're going to be great. They're going to remember your name for years to come. And, you know, we're losing. I'm not playing what I want to play. It's like, okay, whatever, Joe. I'm sure you tell everybody this. Quarterback Michael Robinson wasn't the only one questioning Joe Paterno's judgment at the start of the new century. By 2005, it had been nearly 20 years since Penn State's last national championship. And the talk of the game passing our coach by was swirling around Nittany Nation. There was really a hangover for the program, you know, into the into the new millennium. Uh, uh, you know, they had four losing seasons out of five, which had never happened before. And the Big Ten had caught up and passed Penn State. The university was getting anxious for some kind of an exit plan from Joe. They were two and seven late in the 04 season. People were looking for some kind of a direction, some kind of a plan. Coach Paterno, you know, he kind of got an ultimatum. People were threatening to really revamp the whole program. We were a couple of players away from being a good football team, and I knew that. And I had a great staff, and I tried to tell people, look, if I just keep my staff together, we'll be okay. Joe believed in them and kept telling everybody in 2004 how close his team was to breaking through. Everybody relax, we'll be okay. Penn State is close. Penn State is close. A lot of people were, weren't listening to him. He, he told everybody that he had a good team. You know, and, and so it's, it, I, I, in a sense, that, did I, that mean I build them up? I didn't, I don't know whether I was building them up. I was just telling you how I felt about them. I thought they had to make them, I think we had to make them a good football team. I really do. I don't know how good yet. I mean, really, but we have to make them a good football. And I've said that. How many times have I said that? I think I've said that every, almost every week. And I feel that way about it. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun with these kids. I really am. Well, he really gets wrongly crit criticized. He's not the one throwing interceptions. He's not the one missing tackles and things like that. It was a group of seniors who got together and said, we're going to do it for ourselves. We're going to do it for the Nittany Nation. And we're going to do it for Coach Paterno. And we just went, we, we went out with a chip on our shoulder. You know, every game, every game meant something. Every game was the biggest game of our lives. 
That team was special because they had great leadership. Paul Pozlesny, Alan Zemitis, I mean, they had talent across the board. Michael Robinson was somebody who almost seemed to have the ability to will a team to make things happen. Michael Robinson was really struggling in that Northwestern game in 05. Fumbled the ball two or three times, he was uh, inaccurate. And Northwestern was leading 23 to seven. That really could have put a quick end to that season and cast more doubt on both of them. Uh, but Robinson proved to be just such a great leader and such a character kid that um, you know he was able to bounce back from that. You have a game-winning drive. They had a tremendous win over Ohio State. Football and St. Recovers Scott Paxson. The Dendy Lions defense comes up with the signature play of this game. And it is over. The Dendy Lions have knocked off number six Ohio State and are now 6-0 in the season as they start the field at Beaver Stadium. A loss to Michigan ended Penn State's shot at a perfect season. But the team finished strong with 11-1 record and a thrilling Orange Bowl win over Florida State. Staying positive and following an honorable path to success turned a preseason afterthought into the number three team in the nation. The fact that it kind of came out of the blue really invigorated everybody. The magic that happened, you know, my senior year, you, you would think he was Nostradamus or something. I mean, to be honest, it's like he predicted it. One of the things I admire most about him is, is every kid he, he hangs in there with him to the very end. Sometimes we get frustrated because we're ready to make a move and he won't let us make it. He always says, well, you guys are wrong about him. I see good in him. I never doubted it. I'm pretty sure you guys did, but um, I never doubted it for a second. You know, this team. There was a kid that was, that was doubted, that had his own doubts, but he stuck with it and he ended his career on a great note. They were forever linked that way. Once I can convince the people, hey, don't, just everybody relax. Just give me, all I need is one or two plays. And when that happened, why well, now it's a whole different picture. For those people that say the game's passed them by, I think the thing you got to realize is as long as there are 11 guys on offense and 11 guys on defense and you snap the ball from the line of scrimmage, there are only so many combinations that can happen in football. I mean, everything that's new has been done before. He understands that the game does change, but he's seen most of those changes. Since 1966, Joe Paterno, our coach, has ridden the uneven waves of success with dignity, class, and honor. And staying true to himself, he's guided Nittany the Nation through good times and bad, and prepared his players for life on the other side of Mount Nittany. As he approaches his seventh decade in Napa Valley, questions persist about how long he'll go on as head coach. But thanks to the impact he's had, one way or another, Joe Paterno will always be here. As long as he can walk and feel as good as he feels, his mind is still there, and he still relates to the kids, he's, and he can, he can coach. Everybody has football coaches, a few people around legends, and he's a legend. I don't know if you can be a player or a coach and always have uh, success all the time. Uh, you have to deal with the ups and downs. He's been a, a father figure to the players, managed a large staff, he's been a fundraiser, he's interacted with politicians, I mean he's donated personal money of his own. So when you stop and think about what all he has done, it goes well, well, well beyond the coaching, which is I think is truly remarkable. Yeah, that's pretty heady stuff, and it's, and it's uh, it makes it all worthwhile. Watching what Joe has accomplished over all these years, if that's not an example for me still, and for young people, uh, I don't know what is. Grand Experiment sums up the beginning of Joe. Success with honor may sum up the end of his career. He had success with honor. So I, 
I, yeah, I, I, I want people to be proud of the fact that when they look at Penn State football, then we win or lose, we're doing it the, the, the way it's supposed to be done. Four yards. All right? Take it and run.